Hi. Now suppose you took a height of a class of 18 year old male students and you measured it in centimetres. And we said let x be that random variable. It's going to vary. How's it going to vary? If you were to draw a graph of the distribution, a frequency polygon, I suspect it would look something like this. It would be centred around a mean height up through here. Let's suppose that mean height was 180 centimetres. We often represent the mean as this symbol mu, mu being 180 centimetres in this particular case. You'd have most of the students, it would seem, round the 180 centimetres. There'll be a few very tall people up this end and equally a few short people down this end. Now normal distributions are of interest to many people. I mean, suppose this was, say, a manufacturer producing clothes and they were interested in the heights of people. Now they're going to want to know what proportion they've got to supply within a certain measurement. Okay, They'd want to supply the bulk here. They certainly wouldn't want to supply many up this end or down this end. So they'd be interested in knowing what the proportions are going to be or likely to be. And we do this through working out probabilities associated with distributions like this, the normal distribution. So it's of definite interest to us to be able to study this. Now normal distributions can vary in their shape. I mean take for instance something like this, the volume V. Let V be the random variable volume in milliliters of a particular can of drink. Now if you were buying cans of drink the distribution would be something like this for the volume. It would be centred around the mean, but notice one difference between this and this distribution. Notice how squashed in this is towards the mean compared to this. And that's because most of the cans that you would pick out would have much the same volume. They wouldn't have exactly the same volume, but they'd be very close to that volume the machines would be set to fill the cans with that particular volume. So let's suppose the mean mu in this case was, say for a can of beer, that would be say 330 millilitres. So we'd have 330 down here. Now suppose you had this distribution. Let x be the random variable time taken in hours to complete a marathon by a group of males. Well, that's going to be a distribution, I would have thought, something like this. Centred around the mean time. There's going to be a lot of slow runners and very quick runners, the elite end. And let's suppose for this example, the mean mu was, say, 3.8 hours. Then this would be 3.8. Now, it's been discovered that all normal distributions, regardless of their shape, their width, always have something in common. You'll notice I've done several dashes on the axis here, three in fact, either side of the mean. And it turns out that the space between each one of these dashes is the standard deviation, sigma. Sigma, there you go. Now it's been discovered that 99.8% of the distribution lies within three standard deviations above and below the mean. That's approximately all the distribution. Let's just show you on this diagram up here. If we go three standard deviations either side of the mean, that takes you up to there and down to here. This portion in here is 99.8%. So that would mean that if, say, the standard deviation for our runners was 0.5 hours, then this would be 3.8 plus 0.5, that would be 4.3. 
and then if we add another 0.5 that's going to be 4.8 and this would be 5.3 and if we go back in the other direction take off 0.5 for each standard deviation this would be 3.3 this would be 2.8 and this would be 2.3 so in other words 99.8% of times we could expect to be between 2.3 hours and 5.3 hours. And there's another fact that is always true. That if you were to go two standard deviations either side of the mean, so we go 1, 2, to about there and to there, then this area turns out to be 95%. 95% of our values lie within two standard deviations either side of the mean. So for this particular case we would have 95% of our runners would finish between 2.8 hours and 4.8 hours. So hopefully you can see how important it is to know these proportions within certain limits. Now before I go on and talk to you about a particular normal distribution, I need to introduce you to some notation we use. When we've got a normal distribution, we often say that our random variable, in this case x, is distributed, and we write that squiggly symbol here, normally and we have two parameters inside a bracket which describe the shape of the distribution. The first parameter tells us where it's centrally located, the mean in this case, and it is 3.8 for this particular normal distribution. And the second parameter describes how the normal distribution varies about the mean. It's called the variance. It is the standard deviation squared. So for us you could write 0.5 squared or you could even write 0.25, the result of 0.5 squared. So we have two parameters then. The first parameter is mu and the second parameter is the standard deviation squared. So we have x is distributed normally with a mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared. Now I did say that I'd look at a special normal distribution. You're going to be using it all the time. It's called the standard normal distribution. It's a special one because all of these normal distributions can be transformed onto one special normal distribution called the standard normal distribution and we denote the random variable of this distribution by z and z then is normally distributed with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1 so the variance would be 1 squared which is still 1 so this central value down here will be 0 and its standard deviation is 1. So from what we've seen earlier, the normal distribution here will be spread to up to three standard deviations above and below the mean. Something like that. Remember, 99.8% is within three standard deviations of the mean. Now this standard normal distribution is designed in such a way that we can map values from this distribution directly onto this one. It's done through a transformation and that transformation, something that you're going to need to remember, is z equals the observed value up here, which is going to be a little x, minus the mean, mu, all divided by the standard deviation, sigma. I'll show you what happens. These values along here are called observed values. They are little values of x. Let's take, say, one in particular. Let's take this value, x is 4.8. Notice how we write 
observations with small letters. So if x is 4.8 and I do this transformation here, z becomes the observed value 4.8 minus the mean which was 3.8 and then we divide it by the standard deviation sigma which was 0.5. 4.8 take away 3.8 is 1. 1 divided by a half is 2. So z equals 2. What we're saying is that if we were to come down from this value here 4.8 just project down it would come down onto this graph at this second value in. This is z equals 2 signifying that the 4.8 is two standard deviations above the mean. Let's take another value. Let's say we take this 3.3 .3. When we take the observed value x of 3.3, the corresponding z value on this scale is going to be the observed value 3.3 minus the mean minus mu of 3.8, all divided by the standard deviation sigma 0.5. So we get 3.3 take away 3.8 which is minus 0.5 divide that by 0.5 and you get z equals minus 1. Corresponds to this point. One standard deviation then below the mean. So can you see what z represents? It's a transformation that we take from any normal distribution and what it does it tells us how many standard deviations we are above or below the mean. So if you worked out the 4.3 here you'd find that comes to 1 the 5.3 would be 3 and so on 2.8 minus 2 and 2.3 minus 3. Now what I want to do in the next tutorial is show you how we can use these z values through tables to give us the probability of being either below a particular value or above or even in between values. So I hope you'll have a look at that but do understand that z through this transformation represents how many standard deviations then we are above or below the mean.